<coughs> Good evening, everybody. Uh, bring this uh, regular meeting to order for August the 6th, 2024. Result of the agenda for the August 6th, 2024 regular meeting of council be adopted. Moved by Councillor Bobbick, seconded by Councillor White. Councillor uh, Medwood. Yes, I don't see the HR email uh, in our in camera, so if we can add that to our in camera agenda, please. Uh, that was removed last week, and not all the council here, so we're unable to do it. Right, so that will be in our September meeting. <laughs> I might need to speak to that in the in camera briefly. We uh, we have it in camera. Yeah. Uh, so any further discussion? All in favor? It's carried. Result of the minutes of the July second, two thousand twenty-four regular council meeting be approved. Moved by Councillor Powell, seconded by Councillor Wicha. Discussion? All in favor? It's carried. Receptions and delegations from the hearings, 4.1. Tonight we have a special uh, presentation uh, to our student counselor who has uh, since uh, um, graduated from high school, Domingo Campama, and I'm here to present her with a plaque of appreciation for her time. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Go there. Appreciate it. Yes. Enjoy your rest Thank of your you. evening and good luck in your future yeah. studies. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you. Don't be a stranger. Pop in once in a while. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda is the 4.1 Manitoba Harm Reduction Network. Straight to it, eh? Pardon? Just uh, introduce yourself. Yeah. Um, my name is Chelsea Cook, and I'm joined with Dolores Janai. Now, can I start my presentation? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Um, we work for the Manitoba Harm Reduction Network. Um, if you aren't familiar with what the MHRN is and the work that we do, I'm just here to give you a brief overview of what MHRN is as a whole. So MHRN is a provincial network working towards ensuring harm reduction is universally practiced by individuals, organizations, systems to for systems to address sexually transmitted bloodborne infections, otherwise known as STBBIs, and substance use <coughs> or substance use. Within MHRN, there are 12 networks spread out throughout the province, um, covering from Winnipeg to Churchill, um, luckily for Swan Valley. We have been fortunate to have a network here, which is the health network that was established in 2017. Um, I was the first network coordinator for that and I'm still in the role. So it's been seven years now doing the work that I'm doing. Um, like I said, I'm the health network coordinator and we did um, a community contest and asked people um, if we have this type of network, what should it stand for? And um, People came back with heal, empower, learn, and prevent, which is something we want to do within our community. So that's what HELP stands for. Um, so something we strive to do in the community. Within this role, I run a peer advisory council, which consists of 12 peers. Peers are people who have lived experience or people who actively live with substance use. Um, I also run a network that consists of many different local organizations and service providers. 
Um, there's a couple that have been on the board in the past year, Mr. White and Tanya Powell. Uh, between the network and the PAC, we host monthly meetings, capacity trainings, and community events. The typical work order of our work plan consists of a planning event so the peers identify their needs. Um, we will host the event partnering with our health region, so public health nurses will come and offer STBBI testing, so that's the sexually transmitted bloodborne, so hep C, HIV, all that stuff, um, syphilis. We also offer naloxone training, HIV self-test kits, um, safe supply distribution, and food are all at these events. Um, along with other needs that have been identified by the peers, which were identified in the planning process of the meetings. So we offer like glucose testing, birth control, immunizations, haircuts, mental health services, pap testing, or just like to name a few. And of course we couldn't do that without people from other services stepping in to offer those as well. Um, following these testing events, we offer a follow-up event, which allows for the public health nurse to connect with anyone they may not have access to reaching otherwise. So a lot of the people don't have a phone, so then if the public health nurse can't contact them, they'll see them again at one of our events. Um, a lot of the people we test are peers and they fall into the target population, which are people who are struggling with homelessness, systemic racism, and social and basically a number of social determinants of health. So at these follow-up events, the nurse will still offer all that I had mentioned previously, but they will also be more centered around linkage to care. So people who need hep C treatment, HIV, that's where the nurses will follow up with that. Um, and we also do capacity building at these events. So like wound care, first aid training. Um, throughout the years, we've worked closely with public health around the SDBI testing and treatment. So we saw the need for more treatment options within the community at a community-based level. Um, I recently completed a hep C pilot project based out of Swan River here where we, um, where I worked alongside of eight individuals living with chronic hep C and helping them navigate the systems to linkage to care so um, they could be treated and it's a lengthy process and I know that's like over your guys's head too and like your realm of things so we've been um, working towards that. We've offered weekly education sessions and um, around reinfections and co-infections and how to stay safe, be safe. Um, that was like one of our big things. And then we also offer dry blood spot testing, which nowhere else in the province is offering at a community-based level. So that's another thing that's made the news for Swan River in regards to harm reduction. Um, so yeah, this is just a brief overview of the lengthy list of things that we do within MHRN, whether that be through MHRN as a whole, the Help Network or our Peer Advisory Council within the community. Um, so yeah, if you'd like to participate in any way, we would welcome you to join our monthly network meeting. You can support us with in-kind rental spaces because we do rent from you guys and it's pricey for the Veterans Hall. Um, and if you would like to collaborate with us on Sharps containers and maintenance of the Sharps containers, what I, which I believe my counterpart here will be discussing in her um, presentation, so I won't touch on that too much. Or something as simple as taking training we offer. We'll be offering our harm reduction 3.0 training here in Swan River November 18th to the 22nd. So that's three days of training. Um, on the back of the cards, I have my phone number, my email. You could get in touch with me and I'll follow up with that for you guys as well. Um, but otherwise, that's my little spiel. Questions? Okay, anybody have any questions? <clears throat> Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for what you're trying to do. I don't think anybody can hear me. I have to speak louder than I suspect I should because I have these things in my ear. So can you get two questions? Can you give me an example, a specific example of a treatment process? <coughs> and how do you determine, and I'm sure you must have some successes, how do you determine you're a successor. You're getting people. How do we get them off of slowing down, taking less? Yeah. Um, I think it's different for, well, so there's different avenues. It's cl client centered, obviously. Like if, if it were up to me, it'd be as simple as testing positive. Here's your medication, take your treatment, you're good. But that's not typically the case. The typical way is you test positive, you do a follow up, you would um, be referred to a heptologist because 
Manitoba is around um, a specialist care model, which we're trying to move away from. Um, but there's only two hepatologists in Manitoba that will prescribe this medication right now. So it's kind of like there's a bunch of people and it's meeting at the funnel with two people that can't keep up with all that. Um, but they would, so if they did get through with the specialist, then they would have um, a follow up with the nurse here. And then the nurse would describe the medication to them. And hep C's quick to treat. It's eight to 12 weeks. And sometimes your body can spontaneously clear it on its own. HIV is obviously you've got to take the medication for throughout your life. Um, does that answer the first question? No. I'm thinking of a, a challenge. I appreciate the concept of getting clean needles there for not spreading disease, absolutely. But that's one fact. But I, and I have no science to back on this data, I, I'm guessing that a lot of the people doing the drugs and maybe needles everywhere aren't doing it because of hep C and HIV issues. I'm guessing they're taking because of the high. Do you deal with those people? That's a different question than the first question you yeah. asked me. You said treatment. When I think of treatment, yes. I think of a medical treatment. Are you thinking like... Both. Or like you're thinking absence treatment, like AFM treatment. I don't know what I mean. I mean, the people oh. who are taking the meth, Substance are they users. getting treated? Yes. Are they getting treated for what? For their addiction. They're getting treated for their illness, their chronic illness. Yeah. yeah. And what would that treatment be? Eight to 12 weeks of medication. Just for uh, hep C, HIV would be lifelong. Okay. Syphilis would be two to three injections. Are you suggesting that those people have a difficulty getting to go ahead from the doctors above? Pardon? You suggest it's difficult to get permission to get those drugs? There's so many people waiting to get permission. Yeah. I'm not thinking, oh, the second part of the success rate. Do you have some numbers? We, we dealt with 50 people who got cut off. Or? Yeah, I think you're thinking um, harm reduction as like um, success rates as and help them like get off drugs. Mm. Yeah, no, we don't do that. We just meet people where they're at. So if somebody comes to me with, hey, I'm hungry. I need to, I need help addressing my infection on my arm i'll do that with them i'll say like let's call one of our public health nurses they'll come do a wound care give them something to eat and then that's that because i'm not going to be able to be like like i'm not going to change their mind i'm just going to meet them where they're at keep them alive because that's what harm reduction is is caring for people okay, thank you yeah uh, a couple questions um one you mentioned some in-kind funding yeah for rental spaces our new grant, if you go onto our website, it explains our granting process. Okay. And I think the deadline is the end of February to apply for the okay. 2025 budget year. Mm -hmm. So uh, look on there and there's an okay. application you can fill out and uh, request that way. Um, with regards to the specialist situation, does that specialist come here to Swan River? Are they located in Swan No, they're based out of Winnipeg. That's okay. one thing I'm working with. Um, we just had a meeting with like, um, I'm trying to think of like Brent Rusin, he's like the top doctor <coughs> for public health. Um, we had a meeting with Carol, who's also public health and uh, Mike Isaac, who's FNIB. And they're gonna talk about moving away from the specialist model with the people that can actually move it away from that. So maybe, maybe one day our general practitioners here will be able to prescribe it because Swan River has a high case of hep C and HIV in our Swan River. So do the people waiting in queue have to actually go to Winnipeg to see the specialist? Is this something that can be done online? We're fortunate that we have telehealth, okay. but many communities aren't that fortunate yet. Okay. Thank That's you. So much. Which one of the STIs was almost completely, I don't want to say extinct, but rat which one was that? Syphilis. Yeah, but now it's back. Yeah, it's like 400 and something percent increase um, for from 2017 till now, I believe it was. It was 400 percent increase of syphilis. So. Wow. Yeah. And syphilis is treated with uh, 
an injection or pills. So it's, it's quick. It's free. Anybody who gets it. It's almost like the gonorrhea of today's generation. Gonorrhea is like catching a cold now. Okay. I know. Oh, one more, one more snippet is Manitoba is the, across Canada, Manitoba is the highest for hep C um, and will probably pass Saskatchewan for HIV infections. Mm. Um, I guess, I guess here's, here's the bottom line. I think this is where everybody's, the question has always been, the needles, finding so many needles around town, right? And if we, we have a presentation, basically pictures of everything. We find needles, um, right now we have to do a check for our day camp because the only day camp is. And we have, so every morning and just in the last two weeks, like they've increased heat. So I guess just wondering, what is what, what is the plan with that, or how is that supposed to like? How is what is supposed to happen with that? Why is there so many needles? Because there's no sharps containers in our community. Uh, Brandon will give out. It's an urban city. They'll give out more needles probably than us, and they don't find as much because they have sharps containers and they have a system for that. But I won't touch base on that because I believe Carrie, you have that in your presentation. So that might be more about her, but. Um, it's proven that safe supply is better than, like, safe supply distribution is better than no distribution at all. Um, it do, it's unfortunate that there is needles being found places, but it's also, there's no where to discard of them. And that's something maybe the town council could work towards establishing. Is, is, there, is there any data that says that there's a maximum that should be distributed as well? Like, uh, there's only... Like, to a point where... Like we have, we have houses, like, and these are just, we're throwing this out there. We have yeah. houses that we boarded up with over. Which 20, also didn't fix the problem that it everybody has 20, wanted. needles in it, right? And that's one house. Yeah. We found another house with 13,000 needles in it. Mm -hmm. all government issued needles. Is that. And they were is, open or were they in boxes? They were in boxes. Yeah. But so there, there were also several hundred that were open in every drawer. And every, yeah. There were garbage cans filled with unused needles. There's loaded needles. There's, yeah. There's everything, right? So everything's there. Mm -hmm. But. I'm just wondering if the, you know, is there a data point where there's the, a maximum is potentially harmful? Yeah. Well, I don't know if there's a study for that, but I do know that there is a study, and I could find it for you, Carrie. You could probably help me where um, needle exchange, like where say you give you take you give one, you take one back, type of thing. It does. It's proven not to work. Which we could find yeah. the data for that. Yeah. Uh, going back to Council Paul because I don't think she was finished, mm -hmm. and then I'll go to Council Mike Shaw. No, it's the same thing. I'm just going to think it's like So, roughly, like, is it your, is the harm reduction program part of the programming that does dispense the needles, or is that? Okay. Yeah. So, in any given month or year, what are the statistics for this community? How many needles are put into the community? Uh, last year, we also had um, satellite uh, sites where we dis we supplied uh, people who use substances to give out to their friends. So then this way their friends were kept safe. Um, and then through out my office and events and stuff like that, uh, I think our stats for last year were 150,000 just from my organization. But there's also other places that do give out. So I don't know what Swan River would be as a whole. Right. So, okay. Um, and... Obviously, it's not an exchange program. No. So my question, I guess, to harm reduction, and I think our community's question is, at what point does the harm that giving out those many needles to our community, the people that are in the community having to deal with the dirty needles or these other needles in the community, like it's harming the community now. So at what point do we say, if you want 10 needles, you have to bring the 10 needles back? You know, like I'm not saying not do it, but you need to be responsible and accountable for it. And like anybody else, mm -hmm. I, I think we're enabling um, things to just continue on the way they are. And I don't think it's helping anyone. Like if you're saying that like syphilis that was almost eradicated from the earth since harm reductions come in has gone four hundred ninety seven percent and it was that's, implemented but but it was implemented that's because we're testing that. people though right yeah because we're testing people who need to be tested um but as for your comment about like the exchange like it's proven that that doesn't work the exchange thing doesn't work um right now our government hasn't changed any of our harm reduction 
um, laws to decrease giving out whatever. So um, that's that. I don't think our funding's gone down for doing that. So speaking to the funding now, so you get funding for this many needles. So is it like, is that why we're finding like cases full? Is that like just to get rid of them, they're being given out because they have it? Like how do they get their hands on a case of because I will drop them. I will drop them off. Needles. A whole case of yeah. 500 needles. Because, like people think one needle will last a day, but that's not. That's not no, how. No, it, yeah. No, no, no. Like I'm. I'm. I, yeah. I've asked. I think some people will shoot up maybe three, four, five times in a day. Mm -hmm. But 500 in one spot in one drop is. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, but they're I should say you're not finding them in those boxes in the community. You're finding them in people's homes who were forced out of their homes, right? No, they've been found in the community in dumpsters, actually. Too. Okay. There was people hauling into, I believe, the um, Jason Eisner's place there or whatever. <sighs> I don't yeah, know if that was factual. Arena, there's, the, there's, there's video. Of 40 packets. Yeah, six, I'd like to see. Six packets. Like, mm -hmm. there, there's pictures in here, but uh, they're just in piles, right? So there's 80 needles in a pile. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> that's... The town needs to get sharps containers in the in our community. We do need sharps containers in the community. Should that not be a protocol for harm reduction if you're putting the needles in? Pardon? If you're putting the needles into the community, shouldn't you be putting a place for the needles to be taken in the community? No. Like, how should that be the burden of the taxpayers of this community to have to do that? I'm just wondering. I think, the like, thought. who's putting the trash cans out and cleaning the trash cans? Is that not a town's job? Town can you put these needles in those trash cans? No, but if you put a sharps container beside we it. We have them in our community. We have them in the arenas. We have them in, in the In locked bathrooms. areas, yeah. Yeah. And frankly, I think the users of the of the facilities really don't want them there. Yeah. Like it's, it's not, how do you say? And also, there's no evidence that a needle poke injury can actually um, give you, uh, like, there's no evidence to what, say. Speaking of that. Yeah. What is the treatment for someone with a needle stick injury and how many needle stick injuries are as a result of improperly disposed of needles in Man Do they have a statistic for Manitoba, our community? I don't know. I feel like um, as somebody who's also been exposed to a needle poke injury just because of the work mm -hmm. that I do, um, I had to take um, 28 days of medication, which is covered through Canadian Health. So do you do that and then you're follow up with blood work? Because we had an individual uh, at our last, uh, an individual from the community actually had a needle stick and he said he was on medication for over a year from it. Okay, I'm going to go on to uh, Councillor uh, Metwood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I'm hearing you and understanding you, what I'm hearing is we need sharks containers basically as frequently as we need a garbage can. So wherever we have mm -hmm. a public place for collecting garbage, essentially put up a sharp container. Mm -hmm. If we know there's certain areas that, that are, are hot spots, yeah. Hot spots, put up a sharp container. Mm -hmm. And the more sharps containers we have around the community that are accessible 24 seven, mm -hmm. not just inside businesses, in the bathrooms, etc., cetera, um, the viewer will find out on the streets and yeah. whatnot. Just That's just, it's just like garbage. It's works say, the same, yeah. It's just like garbage and recycling. Yeah. You don't put the, dis put the cans out then you're mm -hmm. definitely not going to get them in there yeah and just like garbage you find a random piece here and there you might find this the same thing with the syringes but um i think that's like where our biggest issue is we don't have any sharps containers and i actually got grant funding previously for sharps containers so it wasn't the town's response like to put them up or whatever but business owners said oh we need approval from the town whether or not that was factual or not that's where it left off that's where i left it Council Mike, there's been discussion about uh, single-use sharps as opposed to multi-use sharps. Can you use it, share with your body, but it's a single-use sharp. The retractables, yeah. Retractable, whatever. whatever it's it's Would that help? No. Um, and there's also, I believe, Carrie, is that in yours? That's in Carrie's presentation, because we just discussed, because we didn't want to, like, double-head you guys with information. So that... Uh, the retractables actually when you use a retractable needle it takes your blood back and then it's actually covered inside they're secured which can cause for um transmission that way but if it's not then it 
gets evolved to the element elements of the everything. Hmm. But yeah. Sure, All right, so I think that's probably covers most of it. Councilor Bob. Just with your clients, mm -hmm. when you say Swan River, is this are your clients local or do you promote to bring clients? To <coughs> are my clients local? Yeah. Yeah. So with the retractable needles, you, you don't use them because they would keep blood in them. Do, this, do the multiple use ones not keep blood in them? They, they, they have the same risk. They have less risk. Am I right? They have less risk? Yeah, and people still will share a retractable needle. There's no evidence that in no place across Canada will distribute retractable. Like everyone uses vanish points. And they're 10 times the cost for one. So it's not a cost-effective model to implement. Right, and I, I guess I just have a point of, you know, as Councillor Boychek was saying, to, to compare garbage to to drug use. Garbage is there. You can say 100% of the community uses and needs a garbage can. Mm -hmm. Not so in this case. So for the community to, to be expected to pay for that, I guess I just on the foundation basis of that analogy, well, I don't use the swimming pool, and I pay for that. No, I understand. <laughs> no, I understand. Yeah. All right. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much. Sorry, that was more than 10 minutes there, Lance. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so the next delegation we have with us, for about now, for three health services. I believe you have a slide presentation, too, or a bit of it. One? Right. Pardon me? A slide? Yeah. yeah. See if be able to see that too. I will share this Just introduce yourself again. Yeah, sure. Um, my name is Carrie Jeff. I'm the Regional Harm Reduction Coordinator with Prairie Mountain Health. Um, I am a Brandon resident, so I'm here uh, visiting Treaty 8 territory. Thank you for having me and thank you for welcoming me to this table to have this conversation. I appreciate it. I also just want to acknowledge because I'm not from here. I may not have an answer to all your questions, but what I can um, reassure you with is that five years ago, Brandon was in the same predicament as Swan River. We were receiving five gallon pails of sharps. We had no sharps disposal, disposal containers in visible locations for folks. And so I was a key player in working with the city of Brandon, fire and rescue, Brandon Police, nonprofit organizations like the Harm Reduction Network in Brandon, and many other organizations in establishing um, Sharps Disposal. I presented to the City Council um, in Brandon five years ago, having the exact same conversation. So um, I do feel like I have a, a fair bit of knowledge about a process and what has worked for Brandon. May not work here, but I, I will definitely share that information with you all. Um, I'd also like to just recognize uh, Chelsea's hard work with the Harm Reduction Network. Um, she runs a really important program and a program that restores dignity for individuals who have had their dignity stripped so many times. And so I think it's just really important for the community to understand the importance of um, harm reduction programming and the support that is offered through the Harm Reduction Network. So I thought it'd be helpful just to start with the definition of harm reduction. So harm reduction can be defined as policies, programs, and practices that seek to reduce the adverse health, social, and economic consequences of the use of legal and illegal psychoactive substances. Harm reduction is pragmatic, and it focuses on keeping people safe and minimizing death, disease, and injury associated with higher risk behavior while recognizing that the behavior may continue despite the risks. So in very plain language, what harm reduction simply means is supporting people to make changes within the behaviors that they're um, experiencing. So we see harm reduction practices going on every day in our community. That's wearing a helmet when you ride a bike. 
It's wearing a seatbelt. You're reducing the harm associated to the behavior. It's the same idea as safer sex, safer drug use, handing out dis and distributing safer, um, safer drug supplies, um, sunglasses, lip balm, like wearing a life jacket when you're boating. So it's a, it is an everyday practice. And so it's just when we extend it to folks who are living with substance use disorder, it's just one other way that we practice harm reduction. We have several key principles of harm reduction. So it's non-judgmental approach. It's meeting the client where they're at. So not only physically meeting the client where they're at, but um, emotionally and mentally. So that's Chelsea talked about going to her clients. So physically going to her clients and providing a service, just like the harm reduction outreach nurses do. Also meeting the client where they're at in terms of um, we may feel like the client should stop using substances, but they may not want to. And so we're just there to support. We support until maybe that person wants to have a conversation about substance use and about treatment and what that looks like. So decrease the harms related to the behavior. It's a very much client centered. We want to restore the power and autonomy to our clients. And that's really important when we think about um, indigenous populations who have had a history of systemic racism and violence perpetuated by agencies and government services. And so um, it's just, yeah, it's a critical and critical and crucial component of the work is restoring that autonomy and personal choice along with dignity, recognizing that people have had adversity and that can affect their ability to access care. And then again, when we think about language, even tonight in, around this table, I've heard some stigmatizing language. Um, we don't talk about needles being dirty or clean. There's other language to use that is less stigmatizing. Um, it's simply an unused needle, right? Um, dirty, clean, when you say dirty, you're implying the person can be dirty and it's, it's not strength-based. Um, so it's important to think about that too. And then moving along to the slide around language. There's just some examples of the language you can use um, instead of some of that stig stigmatizing language. Um, it's people first language, focuses on the individual and not the substance use. So there's just some examples. The newest one is overdose or moving away from using the term overdose, unexpected toxic reaction or drug poisoning event. This information will probably be discussed at the training in November, more in depth, hey? Yeah. So this is just like a little snippet of, of language and why it's important. And then in terms of harm reduction supplies, I did bring um, some of the kits that we hand out um, through Prairie Mountain Health, along with uh, Chelsea through the Manitoba Harm Reduction Network and some of the other uh, community agencies in Brandon. And so for folks who um, may not be aware, you can switch the slide again to the harm reduction supplies. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we have like the crack, the safer crack kits. Is this helpful to walk through this very quickly? Or do people have the knowledge around, I'm not gonna spend too much time, but I am just gonna show you what's in them very quickly because I think it's, it might be important. So this is for smoking crack. You have your alcohol wipes, your mouthpiece, which is so important because you don't wanna be, you wanna move away from sharing. And so if you're gonna share, you can take the mouthpiece off and put another one and pass it to your buddy. So that's for crack. Lots of people use tobacco and marijuana in, in the crack in the crack pipes too <coughs> so it's not just for crack um, this is a meth kit also known as a bubble uh, again we have our alcohol swabs our mouthpiece and so the substances would go in the bubble and then it would be heated up and smoked And then a in safer injection kit where we have, again, wipes, water, syringes, tourniquet, and your cooker. So 
how this kit works is you would open up your cooker. This is where you're going to cook your drugs, substances. Um, Harm Reduction Network has really cool fentanyl testing strips, which is like much needed resource for folks, especially if their um, drug supply is being poisoned. So the idea is that um, substances go in the little cooker, you heat it up, um, you put your little cotton swab in it. You can either add your water and then draw up, or some people just draw up through the cotton swab and then will draw up their um, water into the syringe directly. So I'm doing a very quick example because I know I don't have a lot of time. And then I'm um, like, this is safer hooping and safer snorting. So this is when folks want to put um, substances in their <coughs> anus for consumption. So there's lube, water, a little pamphlet about how to do that safely and then safer snorting. So we also know that um, transmission can happen through snorting drugs. So important to, again, wash your nost or rinse out your nostrils, not share your straws type of business. We have naloxone, which reverses a toxic drug poisoning. And then of course, safer sex supplies, which is also part of the work we do. So we wanna, that's where syphilis comes in. We wanna try and reduce the risk of syphilis. I'd also just really quickly like to point out that actually Manitoba has had the highest um, STI rates on and off for the last 20 years. I've worked in sexual and reproductive health for, I was at Sexuality Education Resource Centre for 20 years, um, doing advocacy work and in management and a frontline um, educator. And I started there when I was 21. And at that point, chlamydia was the number one STI and we were also the slurpy capital of um, Canada. So that was my like running joke at the time. But really Manitoba has gone up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down with STIs. And we're always kind of in competition with Saskatchewan, which is interesting because I think we have a lot of people going back and forth too. Mm -hmm. So um, syphilis at one point, it was uh, an infection that was common among men who had sex with men. I'm not saying gay men because it wasn't just gay men. It was men who had sex with men. We know that straight men sometimes identify as straight and engage with, um, with other men. So that has shifted though. It is not men who have sex with men anymore. It is heterosexual. So it's men and women having sex. Um, so again, just the importance of having access to safer sex supplies too. Um, just making sure that I covered, oh, and sharps container. This is an individual sharps container. We hand these out a fair bit. Um, people quite like them. It's easy to put their sharps in and they can pop them in the bigger containers. Do we have the there, next slide? Uh, or is questions. there a question? Oh, Bobby, yeah. Uh, just, you spoke of Brandon having, uh, doing well with his book. Yep. So, I guess with the used needles, put up in front of containers put out there, that would be up in the city of Brandon to collect those in. Yeah, well, I'm going to give you the whole rundown in two slides. Is that okay? Uh, and I got some pictures okay, and everything perfect. of the sharps yeah. containers. Yeah, so if we can just move along to the next one. Uh, Great, yeah. So I just wanted to touch on some benefits of safer sharps disposal. Um, first and foremost, it is environmentally safe. We want to keep sharps out of the regular um, waistline, right? We don't want sharps going into... Um, the regular trash line. It's not good for our environment. And so this was one of the concerns in Brandon is that we were finding sharps in, in different, like in garbage cans, right? We don't want that. That's where um, needle pokes can happen too. And so, um, yeah, really wanting to encourage folks to dispose of their sharps in a safe way, but you can't do that if there isn't sharps containers to access to dispose in. Um, Sharks disposal can keep your community safe, including children and pets. Like that's super important. We were finding sharks in school grounds too. 
Um, and so we had to address that. We did the education in the schools and we started setting up um, sharps containers outside, at, like outside of the school playgrounds and that to encourage folks to dispose um, and not in the parks because that is a big concern and I can appreciate why people are um, upset about that when it comes to kids. It's kids pick up everything. I'm a mom of three kids. I get it. Like, you know, it's it's scary to some extent when you think about it. Um, we know that when sharps are disposed of in containers, it's a reduction in needle stick inju injuries. Chelsea talked about the reduction in sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections, hep C and HIV. When folks live with chronic illness, that can impact our healthcare system, which costs more money, right? So we're talking about cost saving too. I hate to look at it in that way, but that is a, a piece of it. Um, it also encourages folks to take care of their community. It's just like recycling, you know, it wasn't long ago, I remember growing up, like recycling wasn't really a thing. Um, in fact, I did a project on recycling in grade five. So now look at like everyone has a recycling container in their house. I think most people recycle. Well, I like to think that most people do. Um, and then it's just like, again, an opportunity to collaborate with community and work together to support your community. Um, and an opportunity to educate on safety. Can you tell us about that answer? Uh, yes, I just wondered if the town of Swan River spoke with the city of Brandon, would you be able to give us a comment on what that is? I have, yeah, I got that for you. Okay. Two slides. <laughs> you're just, you're a few slides ahead of me. Okay. Yeah. Um, just some of the locations that we currently have disposal services. Um, the Timberland we did, but we all know the Timberland has closed. The Nelson, unfortunately, is seeing less customers, so we're not seeing the same amount of sharps being disposed in their bathrooms as we were at one point. I was here about five weeks ago, and we were picking up containers every few, you know, days to dump in the um, facilities at the health center. Um, so that shifted. And the fact that five out of seven houses have been um, deemed inhabitable. So I think that's why there has been a shift in the last few weeks where we may be seeing more visible um, sharks being disposed on the streets is because it's a combination of things that have happened. Um, as, as much as like the houses were um, not proper living conditions, it did to some extent contain um, the substance use, right, in, in one spot. So could be one of the reasons why we're seeing it more. And talking to the lady at um, the Nelson, she she did say that she's picking up, you know, needles along the, the sidewalk outside because people are hanging out there now, right? So it's an opportunity to think about where to put the Sharps containers to. Personal residence, 7th Ave is another place. And then moving into the Sharps project model. So as I was saying in the beginning of the presentation, we were faced with the same challenges um, in Brandon. So we had to pull together a, com a committee, which we have here in Swan. We meet tomorrow at 9 a.m. You all, if you're free, are welcome to attend. It's in the boardroom of the Community Health Center where we have RCMP, Chelsea, we have um, some of the public health nurses, a few of the managers from community agencies. And um, so we're trying to pull together a group of people to address the, the Sharps issues here. So we're on it. We wanna work with the community and with the city to figure out a, a solution, right? Um, so, I mean, essentially what we did in Brandon is the same thing. We pulled together a group of committee members. We actually had some peers engaged in the committee as well. Um, and what we did is we, we engaged with a group of probably 10 peers. We ran like focus groups and surveys to find out what made the most sense for where to put the Sharps disposal containers. And I'm hoping that if we can, you know, get to a place where we get funding and we can set some up and we have a good partnerships established that we'll team up with Chelsea's um, group of peers and we'll run some focus groups to determine where to, where to set them up. So same kind of ideas, Brandon. Funding for the first set of Sharps containers in Brandon came from BNRC, Brandon Neighborhood Renewal Corporation. So I wrote the grant, it was for $5,000. I purchased 15 uh, Sharps containers and uh, whack load of liners. And then we set them up 
and we had the city of Brandon um, set up about eight on city property. And so the, um, the folks who had the sharps disposal in their organization would take the sharps liners to the incinerator at the hospital in Brandon, and then the ones on city property, um, the city waste like would pick up for us. So then it just alleviated the, the pressure on um, finding someone to dump them. So it was like a partnership. We had the manager of waste, waste management, Greg Brown, work with us and he was, so, he was super supportive and helpful um, in getting, getting our project established. Um, and then currently I work with Shannon Saltarelli. She works for the city of Brandon and she's the community housing and wellness coordinator. And she would be willing to have conversations and meetings with you all to talk about the current sharps that are, um, sharps disposal that are still set up on city location um, and how that works for them. So she, yeah, and I have all of her information here that I can share, so. Um, we still have, like lots of the sharps containers are still up and they're being utilized. I think that in working with the peers, we will find out what sharp containers make the most sense um, because there's a few different options um, to look at. Can, do you wanna just switch that? Thank you. No, that's okay. Um, so we have this like 28 gallon bucket. This is like a great option too. This is what's in the health centers. And so folks can just drop this right in. You can put a bag, like I have all people come in with all sorts of ways of bringing in their sharps. And so they just dump it in. Um, so that's one option and I put the price beside it. Again, our hope is to find like a, a funding stream that we can access to do the first round of purchasing. Um, and then, you know, get the commitment from the city to help with disposal. <coughs> uh, the second picture is the start Sharps disposal bins that we have located in Brandon right now. These are the ones that um, are on city property. We do have the black, the black larger ones in different locations like downtown where folks can bring in their laundry jugs or um, different things. So, but yeah, that one is... Um, the ones that we purchased five years ago and they have the plastic liners in them um, and they have worked quite well. And then we have individual sharps disposal. So I just put a few different options um, that folks can use for their own individual um, disposal and then pop them in the larger, larger bins. And then we'll also have to wrap it up, Councilor Knight and Councilor Network. Uh, two questions, Rob. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, welcome. <clears throat> I'm fairly naive in that world, in many worlds. And I'm just wondering, are you, I'm assuming you're considering sharing this communi communication with our general public. You know, starting next year, probably it's out there. I'm not seeing it, I'm not looking for it, it's in combination of all. So communicating that that you do should be a priority. <coughs> I don't know how to tell you how to do that, but how to do that. Somewhere that's got to happen because there's a lot of misconceptions. The second question, because I was born and raised in a small business family, somewhere <coughs> there's got to be a success rate. We're getting less addictive people, or the word is, we have less uh, STDs, so this is working. Because if it's not working, I don't know what to say. Maybe you have to change the program, or maybe it's working. It could be a lot worse. So there's another option job. I would love to see some numbers say, since this program was hard for those program <coughs> started, this is what's happened. And hopefully yep. it shows some good stuff. Yeah, I mean, you can talk to Shannon Saltarelli. You, she can tell you about what that looks like on city <coughs> property. I mean, yeah, we find an, an odd needle here and there, but it has drastically changed over the last few years. Um, it's not perfect. It'll never be perfect, just like recycling. Um, in terms of stats, <coughs> though, and like data and proof and evidence, I think we have to be mindful about that, especially around treatment and recovery, because that's so individualistic. What treatment and recovery might look like for me may look different for the person beside me. Like, I may be um, no longer using alcohol, but I choose to smoke weed as a way to cope, right? So <coughs> under an abstinence-based model, that would not work. And so I think it's just, it's being really mindful of, of that component. Um, and, I think there's a bigger issue. I think that um, 
people are living are not making enough money to support themselves. There's mental health crisis all over the province and Canada, and there's not enough services. There is one treatment facility in Swan that I'm aware of, which is AFM, and they do not run a long-term treatment program. So how do, I'm not sure how we expect people to get into recovery when there's nothing available for them. That's a problem. Um, even in Brandon, we don't, like we have AFM and we have 50,000 people. It is a problem. We, people want to get into recovery. They want treatment, but they can't access it. It's so frustrating for people. It's very frustrating unless you have 50 grand to send your person away. That's just not feasible for people. The wait, the wait to get into a non-medical detox in Brandon is nine months. People are dying. We're seeing people die every few days. It's a critical problem right now. And so what, what this type of work does is it supports people while they're potentially waiting to get into treatment. We're at least keeping people alive, bringing, restoring some dignity back, feeding people, supporting them. Yeah. I have a, a couple of things. Um, I appreciate you going through all those uh, kits and whatnot. Uh, I tend to have a different perspective on things than a lot of other people. I did do 10 years in education, and one of the things I did teach was sexual health and drugs. Yeah. Now, back in the era when I was doing it, we talked about these things, but we didn't necessarily have kids to show and stuff for safer use. But to me, it would be no different than teaching safe sex. Exactly. Thank you. So yep. on, on that note, I agree. Yep. In my ideal world, we wouldn't have to be putting ashtrays out in the public place so people weren't leaving cigarette butts mm -hmm. everywhere because there's still a significant amount of people in the population that smoke and are addicted to smoking. So. Do we want our loved ones to be addicted to these types of drugs? Absolutely not. But trying to say we shouldn't be providing this stuff, that we shouldn't be putting shark containers out, that these people should just be ostracized, segregated, get out of our community because we don't want you here, that's not going to solve the problem. And I think where we are at today is proof of that. Because mm -hmm. how many years and centuries have we segregated, and this isn't to be bias but our First Nations people to a reserve and has that worked for us? No it has not. So trying to take that hard stance of I don't like this so you need to leave, it's not going to happen. That's like me telling people because they smoke they shouldn't be around me. And whether it's outside in public or whether it's in a, a building. Right. So I see the value to this, I believe our community is severely lacking in supports and resources. So right down to making sure we have sharp containers around because it's the same thing. Like I said, the ashtrays, the garbage cans, the recycling containers, if you don't have them, people aren't going to use them. If you have them, more people are going to use them. So getting those out there is definitely something. And what we've found is even just having them out there sparked a conversation, right? So it gets people talking. And you don't just throw these up. I mean, um, Dwayne, you had made a comment. There has to be communication. We did press. We did a press release. We did interviews. We, we tried to engage with the community. I have people calling me at work saying, I saw your presentation. I want to talk to you about this. And then it's just helping people sort of shift that mind frame. Um, because people... I think there's a lot of misconceptions, as you said, and there's not a person in this room who doesn't have a loved one in their life that isn't struggling with a substance use. We all do. Maybe we've been there ourselves, right? So, I mean, your point is so good, and I think it's about supporting your community when we look at truth and reconciliation too, right? Like, we're in this together. We gotta, we gotta come together and support each other, and that's that's one of the things that I've heard in this community is there is a lot of stigma and racism and um, it's just, it's, yeah, it's, it's not good. Okay, so I think we'll have to wrap it up here because we need to move on. So um, you have a question? Well, I was just, the one thing that comes to mind <laughs> with this, I mean, safe sex is safe sex, right? But the thing that I struggle with is the kits are for illegal drugs, right? Or illegal substances. Not, and not necessarily. A meth kit. People will cook illegal? their morphine, their T3s. Those are legal. 
So some are illegal, some aren't. Okay. So I guess I just struggle with that and, and to have individuals with um, disease that they, you know, didn't choose to be a part of diabetics and whatnot. As a government, we don't supply them with the things that they need in order to stay alive. Yeah, right? but we and should, those, though. We should. We should. Right? This is, because this is, this is health care. Because there's a lot of money being put But there aside. isn't. There isn't a lot of money being put aside to this. There's money put aside, but there isn't a lot of money. We look at how we responded to COVID. We are HIV rates and hep C rates are off the charts. Like people don't understand the impact on our healthcare system. You want to talk about money? Like that's where the money's going to go. One last question. Just two uh, quick things. <clears throat> Treatment and that meeting um, tomorrow, I think you said? That I can't make, but if you could leave me your info, yep. because I would like to, when I can, uh, attend those meetings so I can learn more. And I can, um, if you email me, I'll send you the minutes. Okay, yep. perfect. And the meeting you. dates. And is there anything on a municipal level that we can be doing to be advocating or working towards treatment services, facilities in this community? I mean, advocating to the next person up in your chain of command, right? Like, I mean, it's it's hard to believe there's not an option here for people. I speak, I've, I've only been here three times. I've spoken to community members who have kids who are, like, they want to go to treatment. But where, where, where do you go? Six weeks doesn't cut it for people. Like, you need long term. Um, and just one other really quick point I wanted to bring forward is that um, I think, Access to substances has increased to legal substances. So when we look at alcohol being offered in a movie theater, I'd like to know what the government is doing. Are they putting some of the proceeds into treatment? Because I don't see it. Or into more mental health services. So we make alcohol more accessible, yet we're still lacking in, in treatment options and mental health supports. Um, I mean, marijuana. Look at, oh, we have like 15 weed stores in Brandon. The government's making money off of that. Why isn't it being put back into treatment options? So in my eyes, the, the government is causing some systemic issues. And I know that's time. Yeah, so thank you all very much. Thank you. I can pass thank around my card that. if you have any yeah. other questions. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you again. For thank you. Everyone. Do you guys like me to leave these kits? Do, would you want to have a look at them or any? Nope. Okay. Use them all in the community. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, later on, uh, communications. Dissolve the building and demolition permits 3124 through 4124 with a total estimated value of $523,016 be received. Moved by Councillor Birchett, seconded by Councillor Powell. Discussion? All in favor? Of Powell carried. Thank you. 7.1. Resolve the Director of Public Works report be received. Moved by Councillor Bobbick, seconded by Councillor Medwood. Discussion? Councillor Medwood. Uh, yeah, in your first part of your report, you speak to the well, doing future presentation for uh, potential. Cemetery caretaker. Thank you. I was just trying to remember the wording on it. Um, things I would like to know or see, probably more so for that report, unless you have some answers now, is I'd like to know the current staffing numbers and positions for um, public works. Okay. Uh, what is some potential for uh, like levels? Like I know uh, in the front here we have like the clerk one, two, three kind of thing. So is there potential for maybe somebody that we already have hired to maybe take a more senior role seasonally? This one would be a seasonal position. Uh, whereas our current positions, uh, like there's students that are term 
and then everyone else is full time. Uh, so this would be more of a season during the summer, it gets very busy. Um, so this person can just be out there. Like we have a green team member that's out there, but they're quite a junior person. Um, and they're focused kind of solely on mowing and whippersnipping and getting that done. So then a separate crew comes out to do the trees, but the person that's whippersnipping and mowing isn't in charge of that tree trim operation. It's during the supervising or the form that's supervising that. Uh, so I see this as someone that has more seniority, well, the position would be a more senior position, whether it's someone internal or someone from outside that would have responsibility when that crew shows up so that <clears throat> the form would send them there to trim trees but then that person would be able to say, hey, you know, you want that tree hanging there, you gotta clean that up, or say when you're uh, stump grinding, okay, it's getting close to three, and you have two sites that haven't been landscaped, so you can't grind anymore until those are cleaned up kind of thing, just to make sure that at the end of the day everything is looking nice, essentially, because our phone has many sites that he's responsible for, so he's running back and forth on this person. Their sole focus would be on the cemetery. It's not maybe where in a town session we get into the, 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 the details of that? Yeah. If it's can, being suggested? Yeah, and I wanted to tie it in with budget because it will affect yeah. budget. Uh, but this is just once or twice a year something comes up that I think this position could help with. Mm -hmm. Maybe more than once or twice, but I think you have another question? Just to, yeah, finish up what I was saying. I do understand what you're saying there, but what I want to, what I would be asking for when you do a presentation is I'm going to want to know who we currently have on staff because this is just a seasonal position. Uh, how many hours do you foresee this caretaker being needed for part time or full time? And as per strategic plan, we do speak to offering um, these opportunities to in house staff. So I want to know, do we have anybody in-house that we could potentially, for the season, be kind of bumping up a grade and maybe doing some sort of supervisory work during that season? And that's kind of the information I'll want to, in addition to uh, in your future report, is just to see how we can tie our strategic plan into this and what it's going to cost the taxpayers if we move forward on it. Councilor White. Oh, I'm sure you've thought of it, but... Uh... Professor Blavik's uh, team on the Water Stewardship uh, Resources, Eddie Shaw, and the Urban Forest Committee, to me, would be a good contacts for you that could help if you hire somebody, or if you don't, those people could give you uh, some help in that role. But I'm sure the Urban Forest Committee would have to. Hope Again, this is a conversation that we're going to get into, so I don't think we need to get into enough of those. Yeah. So, uh, no, then I'll, I, I'll wait. All right, any further discussion on the Public Works report, Councilor Hall? Uh, just to let Council know, uh, Director Harvey and I and myself have been having conversations on some of the patching that's going on in Tonnevere. So right now, there's a, it's tentative that in front of the post office in the intersection, it's been tentatively to be patched, ripped out. Okay. So in the conversation, we're taking a look at maybe leaving that and doing the whole street right through tying it all in once. If you do it this year with that, you'll have to tie into it. You'll have to tie into the new asphalt that's on the side there already, I'm saying that would probably be in the best interest of the town and the street is to leave it for a year. It's not that bad. The guys have patched it. It's not great, but it is patched. And then the tie in would be a lot better to do the whole street. We looked at it this year, but there is a date going on there right now, so it's probably best to let it settle for a year move that forward. So some of the conversations that have been going on is that we need to look at some of the streets that are going on here that in the future, instead of doing a lot of our patching, is we need to do the whole street. So that would be a ongoing thing. We do what we think. So just, uh, just one question is, how are we making out with the berm? Uh, there's an RFP for that, uh, but I haven't got it. I haven't got it yet. 
Okay. Um, a couple of weeks, I should have more info on that. And is there a tentative start date for Centennial? Uh, for the dig? Yeah. So there was a request for an RFQ, uh, so that's going to be delayed uh, until I get quotes back from the accounts. Pardon? Until I get quotes back on that, that one's going to be delayed for Centennial. Uh, just it was brought to my attention also that we put up new stop signs on the first and thirteenth there that maybe we should be looking at doing this painting the stop lines and we need to move the yellow spray paint back for these people that, so they can't park right by the stop sign. So probably the only time that would be in effect would be at rodeo time, but just if the paint grew out we need some stop lines. So thank you. And just a reminder to Council Bobbitt that you have two minutes and uh, you might have went over just a little bit there. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? It's carried. 7.2 Resolved that the June 2024 Swan River Handy Transit Van Report be received. Moved by Councilor Boychuk, second by Council Midwood. Discussion? All in favor? It's carried. <clears throat> Seven point three. Do I have a resolution? Mm, it should be there. Seven three one. So oh, there's sorry. Several, several protective services. Oh, right, I'm not reading it right. Okay, thanks. Result of the RCMP 2024-25 year to date expenditures report and the 2025-30 multi-year financial plan email July the 8th, 2024 be received. Moved by Councilor Boychuk, second by Councilor Powell. Discussion, Councilor uh, Powell. So is this the uh, <coughs> to the budget? Is this what we were expecting? Well, we have to believe it's safe, regardless. But, yes. Uh, CFO Ganita. I'm not sure what we were expecting. This is what they've always provided. So we budgeted so much for RCMP this year, so would this be on par for the budget? I guess the answer is yes, but it doesn't mean anything. It changes from the third quarter. We found it in the last quarter. Okay. For the discussion, all in favor? Opposed? It's carried. 732. Resolve the second quarter protective services report be received. And moved by Councilor Boychuk, second by Councilor Medwood. Discussion, Councilor Medwood. Yeah, I have a few questions. Um, in reference to um, my laptop died, so I don't have the sections highlighted anymore. Um, there are some references in there with regards to the, the uh, homelessness, the encampments, that kind of thing. So uh, bylaws pertaining to that. One, I would like to know where we're at with those dis discussions and if we've had any yet, because I know I haven't received an invite to any of them. I'd also like to What's know... What's the question? Specifically, I didn't understand what the question was. Um, oh, actually, sorry, I'm reading one from the CAO's report. Uh, for protective services, um, one, do we have anyone from protective services attending the homelessness task force meetings and or connecting with our community mobilization group with regards to uh, the homelessness? and how we can be, we're, I mean, we just had a pres presentations from harm reduction. Um, we're reporting the increase in complaints of needles, et cetera, and whatnot. So do we have anyone in protective services that is currently collaborating and reaching out with our community mobilization unit, our CMHA and PMHA, our PMH to, see what's going on with their programming, with there's things that we can collaborate on so mm -hmm. that we're addressing. 
the answer is no, they don't meet for the homeless task force meetings, but they do meet with those organizations for the community safety and well being plan. Okay, so how are we incorporating that back into our protective services though with regard to our bylaws, enforcement? They enforce the bylaws. This, the this does not pertain to the resolution. You can ask those questions in a call meeting, but that does not pertain to the. It does. It's just I don't have the uh, report highlighted anymore because I lost my laptop. When I pull up here, it won't be highlighted. Okay. Further discussion? All in favor? It's carried. <coughs> 733. Resolved the RCMP Municipal Policing Service invoice package for the period April 1st, 2024 to June 30th, 2024 be received. Moved by Councilor White, seconded by Councilor Powell. Discussion? All in favor? It's carried. Okay, 7.4 reports. Start with uh, Councilor Bell. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, just to let some snow watershed staff, uh, we've got a few things on the agenda, but they have been invited in September, I believe. I could be wrong with the dates, I just kind of got this on the way here today. That they're going to go to St. Norbert to be with 1,000 students that are involved in environmental studies and uh, Mr. John and Ms. Davis have been invited to go there, volunteered to go there for three days and help with their fire. So they come with very high credits that they've been looked after to do this. So, again, the watershed very proud of our staff. Uh, not too much to report. Uh, just I had the benefit of uh, working at the Thunder Hill Ski Club booth on the weekend for the rodeo. It was really good to see a lot of people there. And I got I got double whammy. I looked out again and got to work at Stan Peter booth on Sunday. So I really enjoyed it. Yeah, so it was uh, really good. I love going home smelling like oil. Uh, other than that, I just I'll go back again. Council White asked me to do this again last time because we did it after our uh, in the camera section. Right for a reason, a group of motorcyclers uh, got together, started a couple of years ago, and just to explain that uh, this was something, but I guess more or less I should do that. I do that my members. Sorry. Member privilege. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, was, my I was waiting for someone and to call that on you, but you can save those three things for okay. the member privilege. Is there any other thing on the kind no, of committee? Very good. Okay. Uh, Councilor Medley. I don't have any, uh, well, other than the last council meeting in July, it's pretty slow for meetings, but I did want to point out here that in the uh, protective services report under the bylaw section, the second bullet point speaks to what I was asking questions on, as well as uh, under the safety section, it also speaks to what I was asking questions on. So if I could get some answers on that, that would be great. If that means we need to have a protective services committee meeting to discuss how we're going to have the town of protective services uh, engage and collaborate with the organizations within our community so we know what's going on and how we can be working together and be on the same page for addressing these, that would be great and that's fine. Just tell me that's what we need and we'll ask Council right here who's the chair to maybe organize a committee meeting um but they those were in the report which is what i was asking about what about your own report i don't have any meetings yeah. in july other yeah. than the council meeting council right <clears throat> the uh, the official opening of the uh, ct scan uh myself your worship myself attended that amongst many others which uh, thank you and uh, they've gone through at that time a week with some 416 scans, which is pretty remarkable. I have two minutes, so there's a whole bunch of people I will say, uh, the G4 themselves and all the leaders within this, this, uh, those councils would thank them, uh, MLA Wilczek and Peter uh, Stephens at the time, uh, the, the mayor and 
Deputy Mayor David uh, for doing the business plan, the ex mayor <coughs> Andrew Revolt, who I'm sorry, sir, Glenn McKenzie, uh, Lauren Hagelman for the Mill Idea, the Service Clubs, uh, the Foundation's assistant, and PMA's Brian Schoenberg, uh, Dr. Burnside, and his team. That happened, happened because of a community, a valley community working together, and yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Blachek. Uh, before winter holidays, I had to a team meeting with the hotel representatives regarding the accommodation tax. Uh, some good stuff came out of that. And then while on holidays, I zoomed in for some Valley Fire Board meeting on July 29th. And then the regular meeting. That's um, good. Okay, good. Thank you. Councilor Paul. Um, well, basically, this is the scanning agenda. It was really great to see. And I think we had lots of great outcomes. And, and um, just another small meeting with the library, but um, I think they're running really well with the new librarian, and, and it's, been, uh, it's been very, very, it's very positive thing. So uh, I think everybody's very happy. So it's been intense. The library stuff is Good. Good. Uh, for myself, not much more to report. Uh, very few committees. One thing with the, uh, the vet board, um, we are almost the point where we're desperately looking for a uh, secretary treasurer and I think that uh, a chamber is doing the same thing right now and I think RISE is the same thing so I'm going to put out there but we need to find ourselves a secretary treasurer for these entities because otherwise if we don't then we risk maybe not even having them in the future so it's dire in my opinion right now and, and we're kind of limping along with it but it does restrict the amount of time that um, the committees do get, get a chance to meet. Um, highlight for definitely for uh, July was the, uh, the open house for the CT scanner. And I was able to be a part of that with uh, Councillor White and with other dignitaries from Prairie Mountain Health and Shared Health as well. And uh, you have to just think back of when we first started this and to where we are today and, and the work that so many people have put in that you had mentioned earlier, but so many other more and, and people and uh, you know, bureaucrats that chase down the ministers and all that that I mentioned last week. So kudos to the Valley for not giving up and everybody else. And uh, we're, uh, we're up to date and providing better help for our community people. And now it's the next page to see where we go from here. So anyway, that's it for me. Uh, anything from the CAO? Uh, yeah, I, I did accept uh, Carmela Brady's resignation from the town. So her last working day is the 21st. So if you are in the office before then, please come in and thank her for her, for her service. Uh, we'll let council know about a, a phone discussion between the CAOs of the POS and the of Dauphin. And just so council knows, they're very interested in our recent bylaw updates, including the bylaw enforcement bylaw, the structure standards, uh, and the unsightly bylaw on how we enforce those, our organization structure, who's doing what, who's in charge. So we're very interested in that. Uh, and then just to answer some questions, and council should know that uh, I'm spending a lot of time with our bylaw enforcement officers just on the process of our demolitions. Uh, and, and in regard to the domiciles and uh, the lawyering, that, where that is right now is basically just the boots on the ground administration had one meeting last week just to see what's happening within the community and, and it was are there possibilities for its own bylaw do we do this through amending others so that I couldn't even say we have enough to a report on council formally but it's the discussion is happening based on what's happening in the community so it's just that start discussion and, and we'll, we'll see where that goes who needs to be involved, but it's very, very grassroots. <coughs> I will keep it short. Okay, thank you. Alrighty, moving on to uh, eight, eight point one. This is um, on the utility, uh, the letter that was sent from. Um, BG, uh, BN Rentals. Oh, there's no resolution. There's no resolution there. You know what? I met, I seen that the other day and I forgot to tell you that it wasn't there. And uh, we need we needed a resolution there. 
that was my problem. I talked to you earlier today. Um, <clears throat> but everybody had a chance to read mm -hmm. the information that was presented, and uh, we'll go into discussion once we have the resolution. You want to talk on this? Not yet. Not until we have a resolution. <clears throat> How is that? If you refresh. Okay. So 8.1. Whereas non typical circumstances resulted in the owner of 1431 First Street North inst installing a meter size that was too large for the use required, therefore, be it resolved the town of Swan Reef on the difference. And the water bill located at 1431 First Street North in the amount of $26,338.01. Moved by Councillor Medwood, seconded by Councillor Bobbitt. Uh, discussion, maybe just kind of give everybody just a uh, cold. We're talking about the, I think they call it the MTI building, I think is what they actually call it. It's not MTI. It's uh, houses, tax services, and, and, and whatever else that's inside that building. So if you want to get, I'm right, right? Yeah. yeah. So maybe just kind of give council maybe a cold version because this is a lot of money that we're talking about. Yeah, so for commercial properties in uh, Swan River, there's an engineer, like a <coughs> engineer that designs the line size, and then uh, the plumbers install to that line size, and then we put our meter in uh, that matches that and uh, in this case they sized quite a large line that it doesn't appear that the building needed one that large and the different meters have different minimum charges and so that's why each quarter there was a large larger minimum charge than Going to a smaller meter, um, but we we don't want to get in the habit of recommending line sizes to businesses because if I look at a business and say you know they only have one bathroom, you could get away with five eighths kind of thing. <coughs> but then they either change their renter and all of a sudden they're using much more water, and then they have something their engineer says. Well, and a half line or a two inch line and you told me to put in five eighths now I gotta go to two inch line and you should pay for that so ideally they should be talking to their mechanical engineer telling them the services that they're wanting and then going off of that uh, but in this case 
because they want to print a large size, maybe based on the size of the building, I'm not sure. Uh, but then put in a meter to match that line size, which has a large charge to it. And that's why they never went close to their minimum charge as far as consumption. So the new meter that was installed, the smaller one, is this the minimum charge for that meter? Is the 194.84 or 192.84? Yeah. So that's the minimum. So they're not even meeting the minimum of that. They're like just under that one. Just that's under that one. So then it, it makes sense that that's the minimum. Minimum versus minimum. It needs. Okay, that's what I just wanted to double check. Yeah, like they're. Because it's uh, only it's, one month with it installed, or one, one three month term. So. They're okay, somewhere them. between 8,000 and 9,000 gallons on most of their bills. charge is 12,000 gallons, so it's just under that, the letter, the one that they used. Council right. So help me here, so the meter registers how much water goes into the facility. So what, how does changing the, you pay for the amount of water you use, is, to me, is it not irrelevant to what size meter you have? Uh, for our bylaws, we have the different meter sizes and baked into the cost of that would be like the bigger meters are more expensive. So when they have a higher, Yeah, I don't think it's that much difference, but uh, yeah, they're based on minimum quarterly consumption. Because usually when you size a bigger line than you're using, it's just they size a quite large line, but they're hardly using any water kind of thing. It's just, it must be just a few bathrooms. Uh, my only question is, what account is the money coming from? Is it the public utilities account? Yes. I'm still trying to grasp this. Like, are you trying to tell me it's nine hundred dollars for a month for a bigger meter? That's correct. Quarterly. 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 Okay. Quarterly. <clears throat> Thanks. All right. For the discussion. All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. 8.2. Result of the Swan Lake Watershed District Audit and Financial Statements for the year ended March 31st, 2024, be received. Moved by Councillor Wojciech, seconded by Councillor White. Discussion? Councillor White. I just want to give a, a bouquet to that, that entity. I think they're doing wonderful things for our valley as a whole, with the small groups, service groups, community groups, and the two young people you got over there are uh, good representatives for the valley. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. 8.3. Whereas the town of Swan River considers itself a neighbor and partner and a commitment to rail safety with CN, and whereas 229 rail crossing and trespassing incidents occurred in Canada in 2023, resulting in 66 avoidable fatalities and 39 avoidable serious injuries, and whereas educating and informing the public about rail safety, reminding that the public, reminding the public that railway rights of way are private property, enhancing public awareness of dangers associated with highway rail gateway crossings, ensuring pedestrians and motorists are looking for and listing while near railways, and, obey, and obeying established traffic laws will reduce the number of avoidable fatalities and injuries caused by incidents involving trains and citizens. And whereas Operation Lifesaver is a public-private partnership whose aim is to work with the public, rail industry, government, police services, media, and others to raise rail safety awareness. And whereas CN and Operation Lifesaver has requested the town of Swan River support our ongoing efforts to raise awareness, save lives, and prevent injuries in communities, including our town. Therefore, be it resolved that I, Lance Jacobson, Mayor of the town of Swan River in the province of Manitoba, hereby proclaim September the 23rd to the 29th, 2024, as Rail Safety Week in the town of Swan River. Moved by Councillor Medwood, seconded by Councillor 
Mr. Uh, Hoychuk discussion. Or if there is, uh, go ahead. Uh, like last year, can you make sure we put a social media <coughs> post out during that time period just to acknowledge it publicly? See it and you send us information. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. All in favor? It's carried. 8.4. Resolved the Town of Swan River accept and approve the signing of the agreement between the Town of Swan River and the Swan River Valley Agricultural Society as per Schedule A. Moved by Councillor mm -hmm. Boychuk, second by Councillor White. Discussion? Councillor Medwin. Ag Society is fully on board with what's in here. Yeah. Spoken by Councillor Medwin. Yeah. 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 Spoke with the President some of the members last week or two weeks ago. Yeah. Further discussion? All in favor? It's carried. 8.5. Resolve the town of Swan River enter into agreement with the province of Manitoba as a service provider for the Swan Valley Employment and Training Project for the year from July 1st, 2024 to July, or sorry, June 30th, 2025. Be it further resolved amending agreements for the, ser for the services provided by the town of Swan River for the province of Manitoba, including the work crew project and employment training project for the year, including July 1st, 2023, June 30th, 2024, be approved. Moved by Councillor Bobic, second by Councillor Boychuk. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. This has been a very good program for us and for the town of Swan River for several years. Eight point six. Resolved. Uh, sorry. Resolved. The Swan Valley Historical Museum financial statements for the year ended December thirty first, two thousand twenty three, be received. Moved by <coughs> Councillor Medwood, seconded by Councillor Boycha. Discussion. All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Eight point seven. Whereas Business View magazine is running 10 page feature, features on communities of several different population ranges on the need for federal funding showing the infrastructure deficit in rural Canada. And whereas the town of Swan River has been selected in the, the population under 7,000 range and in exchange for a half page ad in, the, in their magazine shall provide the editorial consisting of a community profile and focus on three projects where federal grant monies are needed most in our community. Therefore, be it resolved, Town of Swan River, purchase a half-page ad due upon publishing of the editorial in the amount of $2,900 USD from Business View magazine. Moved by Councillor Boychuk, seconded by Councillor White. Discussion, Councillor Medwood. I have a few questions. I'm not necessarily opposed to this, however, I do have some questions. As of about 2 o'clock this afternoon, $2,900 US is approximately $4,000 Canadian. So as a small business owner, some of the questions that come to mind for me is, what is the readership of this publication? What are the kind of numbers that are going to be seeing this $4,000 investment? Uh, is it something that goes out to the public? Is it subscription based only? And if so, what's the numbers <coughs> on their subscription rates? Uh, is there print and online or is it just print? And who is the target market for this publication? And also have we run any research on what kind of bang for our taxpayer dollars are we going to get for this $4,000 investment? I'm not opposed to it, but if it's not really going to get into anybody's hands that's going to make a difference for us, is this a $4,000 investment we want to make, or...? I guess to, to, to answer those, we can, I can try and get uh, the editor to give me some of their readership stats. Uh, they told us that they're in North America wide, so what that means, I don't know, but uh, that's where it is right in terms of subscription numbers, we can get those as well. I have one of that right now. That's about it. So without any of that information, should we be taking it? That's the choice of counsel. 
I would support that. Okay, well, I'm going to have a motion to table. Motion to table. Okay. I'll second that. Okay. So it'll be table to our next meeting. Do we have to vote on tabling? Yeah. Yeah, okay. All in favor to table? It's carried. So table to our September the, what date is it, 5th? Uh, the date. Can I tack on one more to sure. tabling? Just so you can have the information? <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. Well, at the time when we bring this back to a cow or whatever for information, can we also maybe discuss as a council what the three concerns are that we want to have published? Yeah. So we know what to uh, if, if direct council CIO. chooses to pass it, yes. Yeah. yeah. So CAO knows what to speak to in the interview? Yep. Okay. All right, so that's table. Let's move down to uh, 10, 10.1. Resolve the accounts as follows be hereby proof of payments. General check, sorry, general accounts checks number 31756 to number 31885, totaling $807,742.91 as listed on Schedule A. Checks number 31781 uh, was voted uh, wrong uh, payee and was replaced by check number 31885. Payroll accounts checks number 5464 to number 5468. Totaling one hundred and thirty thousand two hundred and ninety three and fifty two cents is listed on Schedule B. Payroll accounts checks number five four seven three to number five four seven seven. Totaling one hundred and thirty eight thousand four hundred thirty two and thirteen cents is listed on Schedule D. Payroll accounts checks number five four six nine to five four seven two. Totaling one hundred and seventeen thousand twenty one dollars and fifty two cents is listed on Schedule C. Direct deposit payments totaling. 865 is listed on Schedule E, and direct deposit payments totaling 71,569.37 is listed on Schedule F. Sorry, I got this too mixed up. Moved by Councillor Bobbitt, seconded by Councillor White. Discussion, Councillor Medley. Uh, from Schedule 7, I'd like to have explanations on July 11th. Uh, the Matt Chur Corporation, July 18th. Uh, Explanation of what are we collecting PST on that we're submitting to the government? Uh, July 25th, WRARS landfill levy remittance, if we can have explanation on that. And from Schedule A, 31757, 5862657077788, 81838588. 9199497 uh 3182072080113157242256353489415357 58, 59, 65, 66, 69, 73, 78, 82, and 85, please. You can email those to me. I didn't follow uh, Can't read them. Uh, we write them down all that quick. So send those to council. Probably to CAO uh, Pool and CFO Ganita, I suppose. For the discussion, all in favor? Opposed? Uh, yeah. well, you don't really call that, but that's you actually you're saying the state. Um, it's carried. 10.2 Resolve the financial statements for the six months ending July, uh, sorry, June 30th, 2024, be adopted and received. Moved by Councillor Balbic, second by Councillor Powell. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. 10.3. Resident Town of Swan River used municipal equipment, materials, and labor to carry out private work works on private property under the Municipal Act Clause 252E and set the fees and charges for the work under Clause 252-1A of the Act. And where a sufficient time has been allowed for payment of such outstanding amounts as listed on the attached Schedule A, totaling $3,607.50. One cents. 
Therefore, be it resolved that each of the unpaid amounts listed on Schedule A be added to the corresponding tax, property tax roll, and collected in the manner under subsections 252 of the Act. Be it further resolved that the notice shall be sent to each property owner detailing the amounts being added to the taxes and advising that interest will accrue on the set amounts in the same manner as for unpaid property taxes effective September 1st, 2024. Moved by Councillor Mocha, seconded by Councillor Bobic. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. 10.4. Whereas sections 326 of the Municipal Act provides that a municipality may impose supplementary taxes and subsections 306 and 306.1 provide that a municipality may cancel or reduce taxes upon receipt of assessment alterations from the National Assessment Services. Therefore, be it resolved that the assessment alterations from provided by Management Assessment Services on January the 11th February the 9th, 16th, and 23rd, April 5th and 16th, May the 3rd and the 15th, June the 3rd, 14th and 27th, and July 11th, 19th, 29th, and 30th, 2024, be made to the 2024 property tax roll with the resulting increases totaling $74,179.96 and the resulting reductions totaling $20,207.85. Moved by Councilor Powell, seconded by Councilor Bobic. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. 10.5. Result, uh, sorry, resolved that $13,281.91 be transferred from the fire truck replacement reserve fund to the general operating fund for the Acres Industrial Ind Industries Pumper Purchase Change Orders. Moved by Councillor White, seconded by Councillor Bobic or Boychuk. Discussion? Councillor Bobic. What's the change order? Councillor White, seconded by Councillor Bobic. And the invoice is on the agenda there. A whole bunch of things listed there, about a dozen. So it looks like the telepool scene lights that are mounted on the cab, two tone of paint, trailer plugs, water and foam fills, hose bed discharge plumbing, additional HB divider. They were approved by the council resolution yeah. quite a few months ago. Remember that. Okay, for the discussion. All in favor? It's approved. Carried. Eleven point one. Resolve the bylaw number fifteen, two thousand twenty-four, being a bylaw of the town of Swan River, to regulate the proceedings and conduct of council and the committees there thereof be read a first time. Did we do ten point six or just ten point five? Uh, we need to do 10.6. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. I missed that. Thank you. Uh, resolved, uh, sorry, resolved that $76,792.62 be transferred from the Fire Truck Replacement Reserve Fund and $445,985.56 be transferred from the Tax Stabilization Reserve Fund to the General Operating Fund for the purchase of replacement pumper one with all required equipment. Moved by Councillor White, seconded by Councillor Medwood. Discussion? Go ahead. 
Well, that's quite a bit more than the invoice is, is it not? Like the town's one over the invoice with those change orders was just 4304996 and we're transferring over five something there. CFO Ganita. Uh, the invoice is 800 and some thousand. Oh, so the, there's nothing been paid before. That's just a partial invoice, the one that's attached. CFO Ganita. Uh, Acres Emergency Vehicle <laughs> Vortex Series Pumper 2024 Freightliner Series Chassis is 807,070. 7818. Hmm. Okay, for the discussion, uh, Councilor Bobbitt. Can we not prepay some of that? Uh, did we, we do a deposit on that? There were two deposits that I reported at a previous meeting were shown as a prepaid expense asset. They were not expensed. Okay. All right, for the discussion, all in favor? Opposed, it's carried. Okay, now we can go to 11.1. 11, 11 Result of the bylaw number 15, 2024, being a bylaw of the Town of Swan River to regulate the proceedings and conduct of council and committees that are being read the first time. Moved by Councillor Boychuk, seconded by Councillor Powell. Discussion, all in favor? Opposed, it's carried. 11.2. Resolve the bylaw number 10, 2024, being a bylaw to establish a fire hall reserve fund, be read a third time and be passed. Moved by Councillor Boychuk, seconded by Councillor White. Discussion? All, uh, this will be a recorded vote. All in favor? carried okay this leads us to 13 resolve resolve the pursuits of sections 152 3 of the municipal act council going to committee and close the meeting to the public items that will be discussed will be the design phase consultant arena project update moved by <clears throat> councillor white seconded by councillor medwood all in favor discussion it's carried. We're in camera. It's members' privilege grounds. Um, Councillor Medley. Thank you. Good yeah. Thanks, see you. Yep, see you. Yeah. Well, it was a really good weekend at the uh, fair. I was volunteering all three days. Probably not as much as my fellow Councillor Powell here, but uh, <laughs> uh, I was in a few different areas helping out and uh, got to take in some of the uh, activities as well. So it was a uh, Good weekend. I'm not sure if I have much more than that to report. So, okay. Yeah. Councillor Powell. Yeah, I wear it to the um, booth and, and Stampier booth, and I think we had so many volunteers. It was, it was truly amazing to see how many people come out and um, step up and help out every organization there because I think all the booths have been very well this year. Um, I think that, um, yeah, just a great big huge thank you to everybody and a thank you to Mr. Bobbitt for coming and uh, um, making uh, making burgers that day. It was a great, great thing for you to show up. And it was, it was nice. it's just really nice to have so many people that enjoyed and want to be there. So, thank you. Okay, perfect. Thanks for watching. Well, I'm very thankful for my kids and holidays and not having to be at the <coughs> grounds for once in a couple of decades. So, uh, but I'm sure we'll be back there next next year. It sounds like we're going to be available. So, I'm going to go a little earlier. Okay, so I'll come things. sweat. No, <laughs> I'll do a shift or two. Sounds uh, wrong. Oh, I guess you almost wasted all. Yeah, I was just going to apologize. I will get mine already. <laughs> so, but I mean, at the same time. Uh, I'll wait till uh, member privilege time is ahead of in camera before I make the other speech. But, uh, mm -hmm. Just a uh, thought with uh, Mr. Mahal.
Kolchak here, what he showed you and what he told you, the price, do you realize how much money we saved on that alone? Mm -hmm. Do you know what an engineering firm would have charged for that mm -hmm. little spiel right there? But he said, what did he say, 1200 1200 was what we paid for the design actual drawings. That's not including his. But still. His but still. But that's it's still very, very good. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. That, that's fine. That's it for me. Okay. I don't have much of the, the rodeo like I was gone away on a wedding uh, in Winnipeg, but I was able to take two or one and a half days in, and I spoke with the Ag Society, and uh, they had told me that they figured that their gate was roughly about 15000 for the whole weekend, so that's pretty good. So Ag Society is moving along and doing very well. And uh, the number of cowboys, I thought they, they interviewed me and they were telling me that they had over 200 cowboys here for the rodeo. I, I couldn't believe it. So, uh, yeah, the show was really good. Musical ride, I hear all good things. I'm so disappointed I missed it. But uh, anyway, I'll get a chance, I'm sure, maybe someday, who knows. Uh, but otherwise, no, good for the people at the, uh, the Ag Society and all the hard work that the volunteers put into that weekend. Gosh, it's just been, I went down there actually three days before the rodeo, or actually even a week before, too. And you have a core group of people running around in circles doing a ton of work, and, and you know exactly who they all are. So, um, yeah, kudos to them. So, Mr. Harvey. Uh, we had 16 kids that helped out with uh, our elevator display, so that was greatly appreciated. They did a really good job showing the other kids how to run it, and we even had some of the kids running the elevator. and. They didn't spill any more green than I do when I run it, so it went pretty smoothly. Okay. CFO Ganita. I just sent some emails uh, answering the questions that I remembered from the meeting tonight, so if I missed any, just send me an email and I'll answer whatever I missed. Okay, yeah. Um, CEO Poole. I uh, have nothing other than one of my kids was part of the down on the farm. Good. Good. <laughs> Good learning experience and, for all of them. And just to uh, echo that, that this needs to be a valley project. I think I think the elected officials have a role to play in our lobbying for getting funds for this. And, and I, I, that's nothing you guys don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Be able to. Yep. No, I agree. That's it. Okay. Resolve this regular meeting of council now be adjourned at 10 or 1 p.m. Moved by Councillor Powell, seconded by Councillor Bobbick. All in favor? It's carried. We're adjourned. Enjoy the next few days, and we'll see you at our.